Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Pastor Eric, I took my hanky. I hope I don't sweat. Next week we'll sweat. So we're in part three of a series on my big fat mouth. And I don't know about you, but my big fat mouth has got me in so much trouble in my life. I wanted to do a whole series on it. But if I was going to name it something else, it would have been called The Little Things. Because some people have said, well, Pastor Rob, you're teaching us stuff that's in Sunday school class that you should have learned that it's not okay to do. But yet, as Christians, we still do these things. We covered complaining. We've covered criticizing. And today, I just want to challenge you. We're talking about we want the presence of God here. But well, what are you doing to hinder the presence of God in your life? What are you doing to hinder the fullness of God in your life? If you think it's okay to tell a little white lie, you're wrong. If you think it's okay to complain, you're wrong. If you think it's okay to criticize, you're wrong because it doesn't line up with Scripture. Everything we preach and talk about, we do that make sure it lines up with Scripture. So today I want to talk about lying. And most of you will say you don't have a problem with lying, but that's a lie. Let me tell you a story to introduce this, and I think I've told it before. I was trying to be a great husband, so I bought myself a new iPad. And when I opened up that iPad, I did it very, very carefully so I could seal my old iPad back into it. I even had that Apple logo sealed. I, I air dried. I mean, I went the extra mile to deceive my wife. And then I presented it to her. I didn't say, honey, I bought you an iPad. I just gave it to her. She assumed I bought her an iPad. She was all excited. I was like husband of the year. I might have been boyfriend of the year. I don't remember if we were married. But then we were in the car, and Steve Jobs got me because he switched chargers that year. So when they were sitting side by side, she noticed something different, that she had the old charger, and I had the new charger. And then she turned to me, and I put my head down. Yes, I bought myself an iPad, but I passed it on to you. So you can lie without lying. You know what I'm saying? You can lie by leaving things out of the conversation, which I've been famous for when I was younger. But um, I just want to talk about that this morning. Sorry. My kids are texting me Happy Father's Day during my message. All right. So how many of you have ever, ever, ever told a lie? Bro, I'm going to call you out if you don't lift your hand, right? How many have told a lie in the last week? Leave your hands up, leave your hands up, look around. The people that don't have their hands up, they're lying. <laughs> because a study shows that we tell on average four lies a day. Sometimes without even thinking about it, we lie. Sometimes it just becomes old habit. We lie. A study from the Institute of Massachusetts says most people can't go 10 minutes in a conversation when they meet somebody new without lying. Whether you're lying to hide your past or what you do or to make yourself look better, we often lie without thinking about it. But how do we think the Lord feels about lying? Somehow my flashlight got turned on here. What do we think the Lord thinks about lying this morning? Well, let me tell you, Proverbs chapter 12 Verse 22, I'll give you a second to turn there or open your Bible app while I have a sip of my iced coffee. And it almost came off my shirt. So Proverbs 12, 22, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. The Lord detests when we lie, but he rejoices. He delights when we tell the truth. The Hebrew word that's translated as the test here comes from the word tuoi, I can't say it right, to, toaba. We'll say it's toaba. I know it's probably not right, tuaba. But it means something disgusting, an abhorrent, an abomination, something that makes somebody nauseous. When we lie, we could imply based on that that we literally make God nauseous when we tell a lie because he detests lying lips. The Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 23. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitude. We should be praying that every day. Lord, renew my thoughts, renew my attitude. 
Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Now watch what Paul says in verse 25. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. So we should be throwing off that old nature, since we know Christ, renew our thoughts and stop telling lies. I heard an old southern preacher once say, you're never more like the devil than when you're telling lies. And that's so true. It's pretty powerful. And Jesus agrees with that because in John chapter 8, verse 44, he spoke of the devil and he said, he, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why God hates lying so much, because his spiritual enemy, our spiritual enemy, the prince of darkness, the great deceiver, his number one weapon is to lie and to deceive, to take us away from the truth. Jesus is the truth, and the truth sets you free. The devil is a liar, and he uses lies to take us out of the freedom of God's truth. I want to show you briefly what I believe is our enemy's three-point plan when it comes to lying. What is the devil's plan when he speaks his native language to coerce us away from the truth that Jesus has for us? The devil's plan, number one, is just simply to get you to lie in any way, shape, or form. His plan is just to get you speaking his native language. It could be something as simple as exaggerating how big the fish is you caught. Well, that's just a stupid lie, Pastor Rob. But a lie is a lie. If you said, I caught a fish this big, and you caught one this big, hey. Well, that's legalism. That's, that's kind of dumb that you're nitpicking that. For me, I want anything that could possibly hinder my walk with God to stop. Am I perfect? Do I mess up? Do I lie? Yes, all the time. Connie says, hey, you're late today. Oh, Connie, I had a rough morning. You know, Connie, I woke up. I'm, I'm just kidding. She doesn't ever yell at me for being late. But we sometimes, without thinking, we just say things and we lie. So he wants us to guess lie. So it could be as simple as exaggerating. It could be cheating on a test. It could be a white lie, like, I can't go to your cookout, guys, because, you know, I'm just busy, and, uh, you know, I think most people would rather us be true and just be like, Adam, I just don't want to go to your house, bro. I, I have no desire to hang out with you guys. That would hurt, right? So obviously, we always try to find a way, but you still can do it without lying. I would rather you tell me the truth uh, than lie, but we always tend to lie and we think it's okay they're little white lies that don't make a difference but if we really believe sin is sin then we'll want to be careful to not do this it could be lying about where you were really mom i was at my friend's house a lie that i told that i thought was pretty clever growing up is i told my mom tomorrow morning jeremy abe and i are going to go to the kangamangas highway we're going to go first thing in the morning okay no problem so at 12.01, which is first thing in the morning, we pushed my car out of the driveway and down the street so she wouldn't hear it start, and then we went to Canada via the Kangamangas Highway. So I technically didn't lie, and I remember telling my mom the story years later, and she's like, why wouldn't you just tell me? I said, because you would have told me I couldn't go to Canada, and we wanted to go to Canada, and on that trip we had a lot of experiences and fun. But I lied to my parents, and later on she's like, well, what if you had gotten caught in Canada and something happened, and we were actually in Canada, I thought we were going to get caught, because I think we went to Montreal, and there was some big expo with news cameras and everything, and I remember Jeremy and my friends like, oh, our parents are going to see us on TV, they're going to think, but it was a little white lie, but you never know what those repercussions might have been. It could be making something up. That's partially true, but it makes you look a little bit better. It might be something like, and then I said to her, you can't talk to me that way. Who do you think you are? You talk to me that way, I'm going to do this. And then you say, did you really say that? Well, no, I didn't say that, but I thought it. Right? So there's all sorts of different ways to lie. It's amazing how often, because of our sinful nature, 
We will choose to speak the devil's language and lie. I wish I could sit and tell you that it never happens to me, but once in a while, it slips in, and I have to ask God for forgiveness. The tragedy is that we give in to Satan's schemes and end up speaking his native tongue. And we laugh about it, and it's just kind of funny, but four times a day, on average, we speak the devil's language. What does he get us to do? He gets us to lie. Number two, he gets you to lie to yourself. He gets you to lie to yourself. He gets you to think and rationalize whatever it is you're doing in your life. Occasionally, you might even double down on your lies. You start to tell a lie to cover up the next lie, and before you know it, you believe the lies. There are some of you, you've lied so much to other people, you're starting to believe the lie, even to the point where you've rationalized your own sinfulness. You say, well, I'm not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. I can quit any time. I'm not hurting anybody. It's not my fault. I'm just a victim. It's everyone else's fault. It's not my fault. And we rationalize the way our sin. But I've told you over and over again, if it's in the word of God, and it says it's sin, no matter what society says, it's wrong. Sin is sin. What separates us from the love of God? Nothing. But what keeps us from going to heaven? Unrepented sin. Sin. If you live a lifestyle of sin, you are destined for hell. I don't need to be a fire and brimstone preacher to get that across to you. But that's the facts. And we preach the facts. But the grace of God, right? But God, we would all be destined for hell. But God, we all have a future in heaven if we live that life. But this is exactly what happened with King David in the Old Testament. We talked about David on, on Thursday night as we're going through the book of Psalms. David could have wrote a book, How to Break the Seven and Still Get to Heaven, because David broke all the Ten Commandments. He broke sins that weren't even invented yet back in the Bible, probably. But yet he was known as a man after God's own heart. But in the Old Testament, he wasn't where he needed to be. He wasn't at war when he was supposed to be. He was on a rooftop checking out the neighborhood, and then he saw the girl next door naked and bathing on a roof. He saw her, and he said to her, go get her to his servant. He brought the woman to King David, and David committed adultery with her. Then he started to lie to cover up his sin, and then he told another lie and another lie, and then he devised a plan to trick and to cover up his sin by bringing her husband back. When the husband didn't give in to his plan, he essentially put Uriah, the husband, back on the battle line so that he would get killed. Later on, the prophet Nathan approached King David, and he said, let me tell you a story, King David. And he said this story. He said, once upon a time, there was a very rich and powerful man who had more wealth and herds and animals than you could ever imagine. And then there was this very poor man who had one little lamb. And his kids loved the lamb, and it was like a pet to them. And one day, when a hungry person came to the rich guy's house, instead of killing one of his own animals to feed the hungry man, he took the one lamb from the poor guy, killed it, cooked it, and fed the hungry guy. David looked up, and he was furious. He burned with anger and said, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. This rich man should be put to death. He must pay for his crime. This is ridiculous. And Nathan looked at David and said, Atai Aish, which in Hebrew means you are the man. Some of you today, let me warn you, the Holy Spirit may be speaking and saying Atai Aish to you, that you are the man, you are the woman that is lying, deceiving, and doing things that you shouldn't be doing. If you get uncomfortable this morning, it could be the Holy Spirit convicting you. It could be the word of God guiding you to change in your life. Like David said, search my heart, God. Anything, anything, anything that keeps me close to you, show me so that I can repent of it and fix it. What does our enemy want to do? He wants us to speak his native language. He is the father of lies. There is no truth in him. If he convince you of a lie, even in your own life, he can take away the truth of God's word. What does he want to do? Number one, to get you to lie. 
Number two, get you to lie to yourself. And number three, his masterpiece, he wants to get you to live a lie. Claim one thing, but live totally another way. And that's the dangerous thing in 2024, especially in churches. Obviously, this is not all of you. Unquestionably, this is some of you living a lie. It could be your Mr. Christian guy to most people. You come to the men's group, you cook, you do this, you help out, you hang out, you look great on the outside, but at home you're a raging porn addict. It could be that you show the perfect life on Instagram, you have new kicks, you have a vacation, but you're really secretly battling with depression and feeling meaningless and hopeless every day. You could be a Pinterest mom, everyone thinks everything's perfect, you have the perfect home, but you're lonely, desperate, and uncomfortably depressed. It might be everyone thinks you have the perfect marriage. You look good, you act the part, you smile, but you go home and you sleep in separate bedrooms. There are those of you right now that it's incredibly quiet here because you feel an uncomfortableness. But I tell you that it's the Holy Spirit doing things and working. And how do I know that? Because as I was preparing this message, I could feel his conviction. I could feel him reminding me of things I said. And I was like, well, I told James I couldn't help with the house because I was really busy, Lord, or whatever it was. I don't remember. I'm just, I'm lying about what I'm lying about. But I can't remember at the top of my head. But the point is, I'm admitting as your pastor, I struggle with this. So I know if I struggle, we all struggle with this at times. The devil wants us to tell lies. He wants us to believe our own lies. And he wants us to live a lie. This is one of my greatest fears, though, because the devil is a deceiver, and what I'm really afraid of is that many of you are deceived into believing that you're a Christian when you might not even be a Christian at all. You go to church, you know you're not Muslim, you're not Buddhist, so you must be a Christian, but when you look at your life, there is no spiritual evidence or fruit that you don't look any different than the person at work that doesn't even go to church. And this is honestly the thing that keeps me awake at night when I think and I pray for you as your pastor, that I say, dear God, don't let, my don't let me shepherd people who don't recognize their need for you. As your pastor, I desperately need God every day, every day, every morning. And my prayer is that you realize how desperate you need to be for God. I miss that song, I'm desperate for you, that song, I'm desperate for you, I want you. We're going to see that as we continue to go on Thursday nights, David's desperation for the things of God. This is what John said in 1 John 2, 4 about lying. Here's what he said. 1 John 2, 4. Whomever says, I know him, meaning God, but does not do what he commands, the word of God commands, like there's no obedience in his life, there's no life change, there's no fruit. We're not saved by our works, we're saved by grace, but grace leads to works. When we know God, suddenly we are different. If we say, I know God, but we don't resemble Christ, it says he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Many of you may say, hey, I'm not a bad person, I'm okay, but is the truth in you? It's the devil's native language to get us to lie. Why do we lie so often? Here's a statement that I actually believe is true for most of us. The root reason, if you're taking notes, is the root reason most of us lie is because we don't completely trust God. We don't completely trust God. We believe the lie, and we think that our lie will work better than the truth. We don't trust God. We tend to think if we tell the lie, it'll keep me safe. If I tell a lie, then I won't get in trouble. But suddenly we lie, we're actually not safe because we're trying to build a life on a lie. And that is much, much more difficult than it is to build it on the truth. It may be that we think if I tell a lie, you might like me better. The problem is when you build a relationship on a lie, it falls. We might think if I tell a lie, it's gonna lead to avoiding conflict. None of us like conflict, so sometimes we lie about it. But the truth is that sometimes the best relationships are on the other side of working through conflict. So never be afraid to tell the truth. 
At its root, we tend to believe that our lie will work better than God's truth. The reason why many of us lie is because we ultimately don't trust God. Let's make it as simple as we can. Who is the devil? He is the father of lies. What is his native tongue, language? It's lying. His greatest tool is to deceive us away from the truth. We believe truth is a person and his name is Jesus. The true Jesus said in eight, John 8, 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Lies bring bondage, but the truth brings freedom. Lies bring bondage, but the truth brings freedom. And Satan wants us to tell a lie, to believe the lie, and ultimately to live the lie. Jesus wants us to walk in the truth, to experience the truth, and the truth will ultimately set us free. Satan has a plan to get you to lie, to get you to believe the lie, and to get you to live a lie. But God has a plan for each and every person in this room and listening online. Our plan is simply this. One, we confess to God for forgiveness. Number two, we confess to people for healing. This is what we do. We confess our sins, our lies to God for forgiveness, and then we confess to people for healing. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins before God, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from unrighteousness. I love this. When we confess to God, no matter what it is, no matter if it's the first time you sinned that sin or the one millionth time, he will still forgive you for your sins. And he separates your sin as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't hold it against you. He cleanses us and purifies us from unrighteousness. We confess to God not so much for his sake, but for our sake. He already knows we've sinned, but we confess to him saying, I need your forgiveness. Please help me. Give me your grace. But that's only a portion of the life-transforming power of confession. And this is where many people stop. This is why so many people don't find the freedom and the healing that God's word teaches we can have. What do we do? We confess to God for forgiveness, but then there's a second layer of confession, and this is why we do life in community. This is why we have fellowship time. This is why we have men's ministry, women's ministry. This is why we go to the barn for ice cream. This is why we have barbecues to live life in community because we don't just confess to God for forgiveness. We confess to people for healing. And this is what James says in James 5, 16. James says, we confess our sins one to another and we pray for each other. Watch what it says next. That we may be healed. Some of you are in need of a healing. You feel the forgiveness, but you still have a hurt. Find the right person that you confess your sins to. You don't just pick a random person like that. Today I'm going to confess to. Bam. You build relationship. You have people in your life that you can come to and confess to and that are going to pray for you and you can have those feeling, those healing. But healing happened for me when I was running from God. I, I, I got his forgiveness, but I had a hard time forgiving myself. And then I met a group of guys where I could confess my sins. I could talk with them and sit with them. And the Holy Spirit allowed a work to begin in me. And that healing happened. And that's where the healing took place in my life. See, we confess to God for forgiveness, but we confess to each other for healing. That doesn't mean you have to come to me as your pastor or as the Catholics have to go to the priest for forgiveness. No, you go right to God. But find a solid Christian that you can go to, have accountability, and talk that through. Those key men are still in my life to this day. You've heard some of them preach here, and they're my go-to people. Together, we found healing because I had a brother in the Lord to be with. There are some of you right now, you're carrying a lie that you've carried for years. You may be living a lie. You may be believing a lie. And how does that feel? Trust me, going through life, living in sin, 
lying to cover up lies to cover up lies is a heavy thing to do. And when I found myself in my jail cell all by myself in solitary confinement, I had lie after lie, cover up after cover up, and I found God again. He never left me, but I found him again in my jail cell, and I prayed, and I sought his face, and I cried. And then when I went back to court, I wasn't going to share this, I'm going to get in trouble. But when I went back to court, I changed my plea to guilty. I had pleaded not guilty. I had 27 charges against me. And I said, listen, I want to plead guilty to what I did. And I, I, I put it down in the paper. My, my lawyer said, you're crazy. You're going to get the book thrown at you. You're going to go away for a long time. And I said, I can't go out there and say not guilty. I'm guilty for this. So I told the judge. And God was so amazing what he did. All the other counts were dropped against me. Everything was dropped. And I was set free, actually, that day. Because I told the truth. And the truth set me free. All week long, I tried to find another story that could get that emphasis across. And I was like, I don't want to open myself up more about my past. But listen, I'm just transparent. And because, so, if you ever get charges thrown on you, they always tell you to say not guilty. They always tell you. And if you're not guilty, say not guilty. But I challenge you, sometimes you got to man up for what you've done and say guilty. We had someone in our church that had to man up and surrender so that they could do the right thing. And God blessed them. God has blessed people when you tell the lie. The devil is a liar. Jesus is the truth. And the truth will set you free. Now maybe you're not living a lie to the point of jail time and all that. But every day you're thinking about the lie or you're thinking about this. There's freedom here today. There's forgiveness here today. There's freedom. Some of you don't know what it's like to feel free. This is what it means to be free. You want to get up and sing like Elsa. You want to have fun and be relaxed. But there's such a heaviness because you're living in some type of sin that's holding you back. So whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is gnawing at you today, don't be afraid to ask him for forgiveness. Don't be afraid to change your life. Pastor Eric is right. Jesus loves you just the way you are. And it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way because we are meant to have life, live life to the fullest, and live a joyful life with smiles on our face and a song in our heart. But too many Christians walk in grumpy with that, what's the word again, kadunka? Kadunka, on your face where you just look miserable. Come in with a smile, come in expecting God to do something and you will see him do something. Amen? amen. It's the first time you said amen this whole service. Let's go. Oh, there you go. As we close. Amen. amen. Okay, there you go. When we confess to God, he forgives us. When we confess to people, you find healing. The devil wants you to lie, with, which leads to bondage. Jesus wants you to experience truth, which leads to freedom. Bondage or freedom is your choice today. Do you want to live a lie or do you want to live the truth? And listen, some of you, it'll take a step. It'll, it'll take something and it makes you nervous. But God will walk through that with you because God desires that you are free and you know his grace and you know his mercy. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, I pray over the last few weeks that we talked about criticism and we've talked about complaining and now about lying, God, that your Holy Spirit would convict us, Lord, and show us, Lord, even if it's a little white lie or something small in our minds, God, we know that you believe sin is sin and sin is wrong and sin will hinder your work in our church and in our families. God, so I pray, Lord, those that are business owners, you will help them to live a life of integrity, whether they, whatever industry, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you will show the blessings. Lord, when it comes to doing our taxes, that we don't try to skirt the system and lie a little bit here to get a little bit back from Uncle Sam. But God, we would do the right thing, and I know you'll bless us for it, God. Lord, I just pray, Lord, whatever it is for all of your people, God, you would show them and guide them, Lord. 
Lord, those that are hurting today, whether it's because it's Father's Day or other things going on, I pray that you'll be the God of peace. You'll be the God of restoration. Those that are carrying unforgiveness, you will guide them and lead them and wrap your arms around them and love them, God. Lord, those that might be far from you today, I pray they'll take a moment to, to recommit their life, give it back to you, Lord, and say, God, I know I messed up last night, but I'm here today, and I want to live for you, God. I pray you'll give them the strength to go and live for you, God. Lord, I pray that you be with the rest of our day. You'll be with the Portuguese service next. Lord, bless them, Lord. Bless us, those that are hanging out with family, those that are going downstairs. Bless our week, Lord, that we might have a, a great time in you. Bring us back on Wednesday and Thursday and next week, God. We thank you so much for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. This pastor loves you. I'll see you downstairs. If you need prayer, I'll be up here. God bless.